All right, everyone, we're going to get started a little bit. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for, uh, for joining us. Uh, this is the eighth episode of our Pentagon First String uh, webinar series uh, between the Arch Street Institute and National Taxpayers Union. Um, my colleague, uh, Andrew Lotz, who is my co-moderator for this discussion, which I think will be kind of freewheeling as perhaps the intro already has, uh, has implied. Uh, I'll just do a quick uh, intro of everyone who's on this call so we can get into this conversation and I'll, I'll turn it over to Andrew to ask the first question. But um, so again, I'm Jonathan Bidlack. I'm the director of the governance program at the Arch Street Institute. Uh, Andrew Lotz uh, is director of federal policy at National Taxpayers Union. Uh, Mandy Smithberger is director of the Center for Defense Information at the Project on Government Oversight. Uh, Wendy Jordan is a senior policy analyst at Taxpayers for Common Sense. And Nan Swift is my colleague, uh, a resident fellow in the governance program at the R Street Institute. So uh, with that, I think we have an hour to talk about uh, a very, very timely topic, uh, which is uh, everything and anything and everything happening with the NDAA. Uh, so maybe, uh, Andrew, if you want to kind of go and kick off the conversation, we can start there. Uh, sure, sounds good. Uh, and and uh, thanks, Jonathan. And, and thank you, everyone who, who's joining us for, for this conversation. Uh, hopefully, this will be a nice capstone that, that not only covers the, the most pressing issues that, that those of us on this call and, and our organizations are, are covering with the FY 2022 NDAA, being considered in the House this week. We just received the, the text for uh, the Senate Armed Services version of, of, of NDAA, which certainly will be considered in the coming weeks and months in the Senate, um, but also serves as a nice capstone to the previous seven episodes that Jonathan and I did in this series, which uh, at one point featured Wendy, at one point featured Mandy, uh, Nan. Finally, we could uh, 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 get you in on a conversation uh, uh, in the Pentagon First String series. Um, and uh, again, we'll kind of uh, keep the conversation loose. I encourage folks to ask questions through the Q and A uh, function on the on the bottom of uh, your screen in Zoom. Please ask us questions. Talk about uh, topics you you might want us to cover over the next uh, uh, 50, 55 minutes or so. With that, though, let's start where these conversations often start, whether uh, it's defense hawks having the conversation or or uh, you know budget uh, and spending watchdogs like many of the organizations on this call or, or you know, fights between those two camps uh, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, and we'll start with the top line. So um, the, uh, you know, uh, the Biden uh, administration came out with a defense top line for FY 2022 that was nominally uh, an increase from fiscal year 2021 levels. Uh, defense Hawks pointed out on, in real terms, it was a, a slight cut uh, that has been wiped out effectively in Congress over the last few weeks by um, uh, House Armed Services and Senate Armed Services, uh, both uh, approving on a bipartisan basis uh, um, a major boost to the defense budget uh, to where the levels are about $778 billion now uh, in the authorization levels, the, the respective NDAA uh, legislation in each chamber, uh, about a 5% boost from fiscal year 2021 levels. Um, you know, our organizations have talked before about how, you know, if you have 5% year on year boost, we're talking about uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in increases above the CBO baseline to the defense budget over the next 10 years. That has serious consequences for taxpayers, uh, for the federal budget at large. But um, I want, um, and important context for this, uh, I haven't gotten to the question yet, but important context is, is that uh, uh, to probably today, we're having votes in the House, um, uh, two, two different amendments. One would apply a 10% cut to uh, uh, to the authorization, to the top line authorization level in the House NDAA. Uh, that comes from Representatives uh, Lee, uh, Barbara Lee and Mark Pican. Uh, and another amendment that would uh, simply undo the House Armed Services boost to the defense budget. Uh, that would be, I believe, a cut of about 25 billion, though someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and that comes from Representatives Lee Pocan uh, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, so uh, the question is really just, what are your thoughts on how the top line debate has, and, and this goes to everyone, what are your thoughts on how the top line debate has um, played out so far and, and, and or you know, what consequences would a 5% boost in the defense budget this year uh, if that does end up being uh, what Congress agrees to and the president signs into law 
uh, later this year. Uh, what consequences would that have for fiscal year 2023 and beyond? So feel free to tackle both of those questions or just one of those questions. Uh, does anyone want to go first? I can start if you'd like. Yeah. And hoping that my dog, who is slowly, slowly, slowly approaching from my left side, doesn't actually end up in the shot. But anyway, if she does, she's a budget watchdog. That's why I keep her around. Uh, the, I, I am duty bound, first of all, to point out, uh, as someone who has worked for an appropriator, that the authorizers can do whatever they like in saying that they are increasing the Pentagon top line by $23.9 billion. No, unless the appropriators at the same time or in the same fiscal year add that to their top line, uh, it is not an increase. It's an increase in authority to spend money, but it's not an increase in money. So I'm duty bound to point that out. The House appropriators did not, when they marked, did not add any, well, I, they might have added a small amount, but it wasn't any 23.9 or 25 billion in spending. So all eyes to the Senate Appropriations Committee to see what the Defense Subcommittee does uh, when they mark and whether or not, because that's where the rubber meets the fiscal road. Uh, so just want to get that out of the way. W this whole idea of adding three to five percent real growth to the defense budget, real growth meaning after any inflation, uh, that idea came up a couple of years ago in a commission report. Uh, and uh, I was curious about that. So we ran the numbers at Taxpayers for Common Sense and found that you would pretty quickly uh, get to over a trillion dollars just for the defense budget. So within five years, um, let's see, I have, as a matter of fact, I have the chart right here. Uh, uh, if you had a 3% increase, um, and I use the 051 number, so just Pentagon spending, not the larger national security spending. But uh, if you had a 3% increase by FY26, you'd be at $910 billion just for the Pentagon. Uh, if you had a 4% increase, it would be 955.3. And the big kahuna 5% increase, uh, it would be $1.002 trillion just for the Pentagon. So that's where this path would lead us. And I leave it to my other panelists to discuss why we think uh, that would be fiscally reckless. Just what I would quickly add on to that, the obligatory thing for me to point out is that commission that recommended those increases most of them are defense contractors who have financial interests in making sure that the budget goes up. So it's not exactly an impartial take on where we should be going. But I think what we're seeing is that this is a debate about, you know, what are our budget priorities going to be for the future? Um, and so it is going to be a real test with the votes this afternoon to see to what degree are we going to have fiscal accountability at the Pentagon. And from the perspective of the project on government oversight, you know, we investigate a lot of these weapons programs. And I think it's important to look at what is the message that's being sent when we have so many failed programs like the F-35 and that we decide not are we, are we gonna barely hold them accountable? At least they decided that they didn't increase F-35s in the authorization bill for the most part, but we're gonna write them a new blank check. You know, I think this is really sending the worst message to the Department of Defense and those inside the building who are trying to do the right thing that there's not gonna be any accountability. There's no one who's gonna make sure that you're being a responsible steward with taxpayer dollars. And the end result of that isn't just wasted funds. It's weapon systems that are unreliable. It's reducing readiness. It's, make, it's continuing to have to pay for some of these systems and taking money away from training. It has real impacts for our national security in addition to our fiscal security. And it's important that we hold the department accountable for its failures. Well, especially in a post-Budget Control Act era, this is particularly dismaying. In the past, we were always, you know, the argument was, well, we need parity between these um, things, between defense and, and non-defense. And that was often an excuse to bust up non-defense, but, you know, that, but um, we'd always be told, especially by fiscal conservatives, that you know, if we didn't have this parity in place, then we would save all this money and we wouldn't have the same 
incentives coming from the other side and and also you know obama had gutted the military and we need to spend more even though that wasn't remotely true but now you know we've had plus ups we've had plus ups year after year after year at what point isn't it is the the gutting at an end and at what point um do we say enough now that you know we're evaluating um things for their own sake and not because of line items or caps or all the other drama around those numbers we've apparently decided that there's just no end in sight and we will just keep spending and we'll never restrain ourselves it's very very disappointing i would also add andrew that the it was particularly clever would be the the positive spin you could put on it insidious would be the negative spin you could put on it uh, that the that the increase in the house armed services committee was very specific to every unfunded priority list which is one thing uh, that we will talk about later and um, something like 200 specific member requests that had not been met met uh by the um committee uh the chairman's mark so it was you know you're literally putting members in uh the position of of voting against something they asked for uh and that's a tough position to put politically to put someone in because presumably if they ask for it they think it's important uh they also don't want to be tagged with well, the CENTCON commander said we need X and you voted against that. Um, so it's, it was, um, I'll put the most positive spin on it. It was clever uh, for, uh, when the, the sponsor of the amendment to add $23.9 billion crafted it in exactly that way. And that's a kind of thing that makes it very hard to argue against. I mean, we, all of us can argue against it, but it's harder politically for the members to argue against it. I would call it corrupt. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, and on the floor, it's even, you know, that incentive has only gotten worse. It's really clear that, I mean, this is department of everything on crack. <laughs> it has just exploded. We saw that, you know, in the last M block adoption of amendments, we have um, bills related to the interior, to land, to all kinds of things. And especially if this is the only thing moving, of course, everyone's gonna, you know, try to attach their thing. And I understand that, but now why would anyone, why would anyone oppose it? when everyone gets something. Well, and I think what's also interesting about that is that it always seems to only happen in one direction. So, I mean, you can make an argument, okay, we have these unfunded priorities, right? These things really need to be funded, fine. Um, but let's also consider, you know, the other thing that's been in the news in the last few months, of course, is that Afghanistan, we're reducing our presence in Afghanistan, we reduced our presence prior to that in, in Iraq, um, and yet the requests from, you know, in, in OCO, for example, just continue to go up, or at least they say at that same level, um, and one would think that given that we're reducing that presence in Afghanistan, that might actually put downward pressure on the Pentagon budget. I mean, I've asked the question before, I think in one of these, these um, webinars, you know, about in the post Cold War era, right, we saw a reduction in Pentagon spending because of the fact that we were no longer engaging in quite the same way. And, you know, whether or not that would occur today, if we had been, if we were ending the Cold War today in 2021, it seems to me we would just be continuing along with the same level of, of spending at the Pentagon, or maybe even increasing completely separately from whatever those, you know, strategic goals are of, of the department. And so, Maybe we should talk a little bit about uh, the role of, of Afghanistan in this context. You know, um, why aren't we seeing decreases in in the Pentagon budget when we are changing our, our sort of strategic objective in what has been one of the more important you know buckets of of where we've been spending money for the last you know two decades? Um, why don't we see that? And what are the ways, I guess, in which the um, you know that conflict has or apparently has not um, you know affected the 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 top line numbers. I think it has a lot to do with the stuff that Mandy works on in terms of um, 
contractors and and jobs and I mean, even the pandemic has been a boon for them. I think it's also really disappointing that we're not really reckoning with how we failed in Afghanistan. We spent a lot of money. We lost a lot of lives there. And it's clear that it didn't make us safer. We didn't accomplish what we were trying to achieve. And the fact that we are just continue, now we're just looking to the next conflict instead of trying to have a real conversation about what is our national security strategy? Do we need to rethink what we are doing? And very few people seem to want to have that conversation. And there's very little pressure. You know, we're printing money right now. So, <laughs> you know, to the degree that we took any money from the drawdown for Afghanistan, it was just immediately reshuffled to other priorities. And yeah. that that is, oh, sorry, go ahead, Wendy. No, go ahead, Andrew. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, to, to your point, Mandy, that that is that is something that is so disappointing to me because we had conceivably we had a narrow window uh, 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 to say, OK, you're uh, no longer spending billions that the Pentagon had budgeted for for Afghanistan security forces, the national police. Um, you know, due to, you know, uh, uh, the, the collapse of the, the Afghan government and, and the, the uh, coming uh, to power of the Taliban, um, we had a narrow window to say, okay, you budgeted, what was it, six, seven billion for that? I could be off uh, by, by, by a few billion, so someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you know, let's, let's re-divert that or take just plain take it out of the top line. There, there were several options that I, I think advocates and experts on this call uh, outside, uh, you know, other organizations that we work for, members of Congress, you know, considered, okay, do we re-divert that to Afghan refugee resettlement, uh, which is obviously a pressing matter for, for uh, uh, U.S. policymakers right now. Do we, do we simply reduce the top line? Uh, and, you know, uh, but, I, I think that opportunity is already gone. Uh, you know, the the money has already, as as you uh, mentioned, Mandy, the, the the money has already been shuffled to other priorities, and and the conversation now, I I, I think I, I forget who said it the other day, but uh, a more hawkish lawmaker uh, effectively made the argument of of we we can't we can't reduce and in fact have to increase Pentagon spending because the last 20 years of war have depleted, you know, equipment and weapon systems. And, and, and so it's a, it's a heads I win tails you lose argument that, um, you know, uh, you know, if we're spending on, uh, if we're spending on war, well, you know, we have to spend more, we have to win the war. If we're not spending on war, um, you know, well, we have to prepare for the next war, you know, we have to, you know, pivot to, there, there is always going to be a justification for, for higher and higher top lines. And this, to your point, Nan, on Budget Control Act should have been an inflection point. We are, what is it? It's September th 23rd. We are seven days away from the official end of the Budget Control Act era. Uh, we are several weeks into uh, the end of uh, America's 20-year military presence in Afghanistan. This should have been a major inflection point on the size and scope of the, of the defense budget. And what we're seeing in the House now, and depending on how the vote goes today on the 10% cut amendment, on the $24 billion cut amendment, uh, I'm guessing we're not going to see a robust discussion uh, uh, of, of uh, you know, how to right size the Pentagon budget for the future. And, and uh, I don't mean to be all despairing and depressing and, and bring down the mood uh, of the conversation here. But uh, that is something I'm thinking a lot about because from both a budget perspective and a war and national security perspective, we should be at an inflection point and it feels like we're not. I have to say when the, when the Biden budget came out for FY22, when we finally got the real details of it in, at the end of May, we were all on this call very pleased to see a request specifically for OCO went away. There, there was not a request for overseas contingency operations. However, uh, that whatever was 58 billion in FY21, 59 billion. Um, the, one of the things you might assume 
is that as we're getting out of Afghanistan, uh, as we are no longer requesting money through OCO, that the base budget, as they call it, would come down, as you were saying, by you know a few billion. Uh, at TCS, we were kind of expecting it to come down. You know, it, it is it proves that OCO was a total budget dodge. It had toward the end zip to do with overseas contingency operations and was used instead for, and they admitted it, for base requirements. Uh, and so, okay, budget watchdogs on this call are now waiting for those savings to kick in. Uh, and I have to say, if it didn't happen in the FY22 budget, there's a little hope for FY23. And after that, I'm afraid all hope is lost. Well, oh, sorry, go ahead, John. Oh, I was just gonna say, I mean, I think it's, I think just maybe this reiterates some points that have already been made, but there's, I think it really comes down to this, um, you know, the way you put it, Andrew, this, this um, heads, heads I win, tails you lose argument where it's basically, if, if something goes well, and the argument is we just spend more on that. Look, it's working, it goes well. But when something doesn't go well, it's it didn't go well because they didn't have enough money. And so there's no, you know, that's a very difficult messaging problem, I think, to um, to resolve. It's, I think, why we've struggled to see, you know, sort of fiscal responsibility at the Pentagon for so long. It's just because that that logic is constantly being hammered. And then you overlay on top of that. The incentive problems we talked about earlier, where members of Congress sort of always have the incentive to, you know, brag about the money they're bringing home to the district. Well, you know, there's a reason why the F-35 is being manufactured in literally every single district in the country. And so it's those two things, I think, working in tandem that is a big part of this problem. Well, and, and um, because I'm arguably the one that got us down this 20 minute depressing track. I, I want to I, I want to actually turn us to, to some more optimistic, uh, uh, s s some more optimistic endeavors. And, and uh, I'll start with something you mentioned earlier, Wendy, and that all of our organizations have been working hard on, uh, which is unfunded priorities lists. Um, we cover these uh, in their own uh, in, in, in our own episode of, of uh, Pentagon Purse Strings webinar uh, a couple of months ago um, uh, with an excellent panel that was um, uh, led by uh, an editor from Bloomberg Opinion. Um, we, uh, we talked with Mark Thompson at Project on Government Oversight, uh, who, who's been an expert uh, uh, on these matters for anyone on the call who's uninitiated. These are, uh, uh, our organizations have called them wish lists. Uh, they are statutorily required lists uh, of projects and programs uh, and funding amounts that the service branches of the military and the combatant commands are required to furnish to Congress every single year um, uh, that were not included in the base Department of Defense budget submitted by uh, the Secretary of Defense and with the uh, explicit support of, of the White House and the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, we have criticized this practice, this this budgeting practice, as wasteful. Uh, uh, we have argued that it undermines civilian control uh, of the military, since it essentially allows the service branch leaders and the combatant command leaders to do an end run around uh, the Secretary of Defense and go tell lawmakers, uh, basically give them a roadmap for increasing the defense budget. All of our organizations warned that in a post budget control act era, which starts in this upcoming fiscal year. It would put significant upward pressure on the Pentagon budget uh, that has proven to be true. Uh, uh, as, as you pointed out, Wendy, uh, um, you know, uh, a lot of the arm, House Armed Services boost to the defense budget uh, pretty much just fulfilled a number of unfunded priorities uh, 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 on, on those lists this year. But there is an effort in the House to curb at least the statutory requirements for this practice. Uh, and Wendy, you've been leading a lot of the work on that. Can you share with us uh, what's happening with that and, and maybe give us a status update? Well, you're generous to say that I've been leading it. Uh, all of our groups have been definitely been part of making this argument to the Hill. Um, first, you, you mentioned that they're statutorily required. That is a very new uh, uh, twist to the unfunded priorities list. First of all, they used to be called unfunded requirements, and it was um, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld, as I recall, who said, if it's not in the budget, it can't be a requirement. 
okay? So they changed it to unfunded priorities, fine. Uh, the, um, uh, back in the day when I was a young congressional staffer, so that's a while ago, uh, when the original uh, dog and pony show budget hearings would happen at the beginning of the budget cycle. So your budget comes out in February and you know the heavy uh, hearing cycle is February and March to talk about the budget. And um, at appropriations, we would have um, a hearing where the secretary of, I'm gonna go with the Navy as the example. The secretary of the Navy would be there, the Commandant of the Marine Corps would be there, the Chief of Naval Operations would be there, the three people on the panel, uh, and they would be, they'd be talking about the budget. And at the end of the budget request, at the end of the hearing, the chairman of the committee or the ranking would say to the two military leaders, while the secretary is sitting right there, uh, are there things that didn't end up in the budget that you would have liked to have in the budget? And naturally they would say, well, yes, because things always fall out in the budget process. You know, either the Office of the Secretary of Defense says, no, that's not, you know, we don't have room for that. Or the Office of Management budget does something. Things always drop out in the budget process because you can't buy everything. Well, it used to be you couldn't buy everything. Uh, so the, the list would be the the chairman or the ranking would say, "Could you send us a list?" And it was a lot of kabuki theater. You know, everybody expected it to happen. They knew it was going to happen. Why, yes, sir, I happen to have a list right here. Uh, and the list would be passed over. And they were, you know, fifteen, twenty items for each military service. That's how they started. Uh, and it was very informal but highly expected that this would happen. So then um, Secretary Gates uh, uh, decided that he didn't like that process. Uh, he didn't want the services going around OSD and making these requests. And so the Secretary of Defense said, I think at the beginning he said, I need to see the list first. Maybe we back for a year it was uh, no, no, you're not, you're not sending these. So that's what led us to the statutory requirement. And again, that started slowly. The services were asked to do it. And then I think SOCOM was asked to do it. And then boom, all the combatant commanders. Um, so it, it becomes 47 bites of the apple, right? You know, you have the budget request and then you have, you know, each of the services and then, ugh. So it becomes this constantly expanding circle of, you know, of hell, as far as I'm concerned, with, from a budget process of things that didn't make the cut, um, but, you know, people would like to, services would like to have, or the combatant commander would like to have. I would point out that it's the military services that train and equip. That's what they do, uh, military forces. So for the combatant commanders have their normal process uh, when they're building the budget for saying, this is what I need. And they go th through the whole process and to short circuit it like this and to give each of the combatant commanders, which is a lot of organization, uh, the opportunity to make up their own list is a, um, an unruly, unwieldy approach to doing this. Um, uh, Representative Schrader of Oregon offered an amendment yesterday uh, that would take the system back to all the requests have to come through the military services or SOCOM and not missile defense agency and you know blah 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 all the all the combat commanders. Um, unfortunately, on the floor yesterday, he was called naive and was told I think that it was um, his idea was. Uh, dangerous, I think, was one of the ways it was described. And I'm fortunate as the system worked for a solid 30 years before it went completely off the rails. Uh, so the amendment uh, should may have had its vote by now. I think they were starting votes at 12:30, right? Uh, the amendment was um, was discussed on the floor yesterday. Dr. Schrader, um, you know, uh, uh, defended his ideas on the floor, and we'll see what happens in the vote. Uh, but again, members hate to vote against something that they may have, uh, they may be supporting. So we'll see how that goes. But uh, 
Mandy has also worked a good bit on the unfunded priorities. So she may have things she wants to say. No, I mean, I think the only thing I would really add is uh, Representative Jayapal had offered an amendment that would have gotten rid of all of the unfunded priorities and that this is something that the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee has supported in the past too, because you don't have any budget discipline. And you know, the only other thing I would add about the gamemanship is, you know, we kind of refer to it as the Washington Monument strategy. You only put popular things on these unfunded priorities lists. So you, it's a continued way of gaming the system and not focusing on how do we manage what we have? How do we actually be good stewards of what we have? It's just always trying to get more money. And again, as Wendy points out, there is nothing by getting rid of these statutory requirements that precludes them from being able to communicate with Congress, and nor would there ever be. But the idea that you are creating a requirement and some of these cases, it's been, we're taking money from your office if you don't come up with a list. So it doesn't even give you the opportunity to try and demonstrate fiscal restraint. It's very clear what the game is here. The game is to spend more money. And so I'm hoping, yeah, if, if the vote hasn't happened yet, it's happening soon as, as members get more educated about this issue that we will continue to see progress just so that we can start to have some modicum of fiscal discipline. This isn't something that other government agencies get to have where they get to have multiple bites at the apple. The arguments that Jonathan was making before, we can say the same thing, but have done better with more money or not, whether the facts bear that out. It, we're just asking for the Department of Defense to be held to the standards of reality like we want every other agency to be. Right, that's an important point. It, it removes this, the Schrader Amendment removes the statutory requirement. It doesn't say you can't offer these lists. Uh, and there was some reporting this morning, I won't mention the outlet, uh, there was some reporting this morning that the um, Schrader Amendment precludes the combatant commanders from offering these lists. Not true. The, again, the chairman of the committees or, or any member of the committee when the COCOMs are up on the Hill testifying can say, hey, send us your list. And it would happen. It, this removes the requirement that it must happen. Because, you know, H reports a vacuum, right? I want to speak to that horrible rhetoric that Wendy mentioned that Dr. Schrader had to experience yesterday. That just, it reflects so much about why it's extra challenging to try to reduce wasteful spending at the Pentagon because everything is dangerous. Not having the tanks that we don't really use anymore and we send them straight to the desert, dangerous. Not having, you know, these items that aren't part of the strategy, dangerous. <laughs> um, all these things, whereas, you know, in other agencies, you know, if Farmers who don't actually farm don't get payments. Hard to argue that's dangerous. It's a little bit easier um, for us to, you know, try to make reforms there. Not that it's not hard slash impossible, but at least people aren't saying that's dangerous. That you know you are putting everyone at risk. You hate America and just all of that. That's so dismaying. I mean, and it's why we can't just talk about these in a mature, calm, logical fact, fashion, to really look at the facts, look at what we can afford and what we actually need. It's all dangerous and scary. And Dr. Schrader ended his um, floor statement by saying, if it wasn't in a request of over $700 billion, the largest part of the discretionary budget, how big a priority can it really be? And I think that is the other crux of the point. Uh, you know, the, the Pentagon has the highest top line discretionary budget, by far the highest top line. And it somehow these items didn't make it into that uh, into the budget. Then maybe, maybe not waste, but maybe it can be done without. Um, I, I wanna I wanna make one more point on, on unfunded priorities. Um, agree with everything that's been said here, but I, I, I think a, a reasonable skeptic could sort of take what we were saying a minute or two, two ago that, oh, you know, even if you get rid of the requirements, the combatant commands and the service branches can still provide those lists to, to members of Congress on request. Um, 
a reasonable skeptic might ask, well, why are you trying to get rid of the requirements then if this is just going to happen anyway? And, and here's one important reason why the, 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 the organizations on this call, along with several organizations across the ideological spectrum, sent a letter to Secretary Austin a few months ago uh, asking, um, uh, asking him to, to sort of uh, take up a leadership role in in asking the service branches and com combatant commands to, to rein in their lists. Uh, we saw Secretary Gates do this under President Obama. And I believe uh, thanks to Mark Thompson's reporting, uh, uh, Mark Thompson of POGO at the time, he was at uh, Time Magazine. Uh, th uh, thanks to his reporting, we know that those unfunded priorities lists uh, got cut in size by about 90% from one year to the next. So a Secretary of Defense who is committed to curtailing this practice uh, can actually make a meaningful dent in the size and scope of these lists and therefore the size and scope of the upward pressure on the defense budget that unfunded priorities lists create. Uh, but the Secretary can only do so much when there is a statutory requirement uh, that that the service branches and the combatant commands and all various components and parts of, of, of the sprawling DOD enterprise are required to furnish these lists every year to Congress. So getting rid of the statutory requirements will hopefully enable someone like Secretary Austin, if he can take up the leadership mantle uh, of Secretary Gates uh, from, from more than 10 years ago, to rein in the service branches and combatant commands, bring them in and say, hey, you know, now that we no longer are required to send these lists to Congress, you know, let's put a stop to this practice, uh, you know, or, or let's, you know, you know, e even if we can't get it down to, you know, zero uh, percent uh, to, to no more unfunded priorities lists being sent over to Congress, we can we can get them down uh, to a level uh, the of uh, 10% of what they are because we know it's been done before. Um, so uh, did, uh, did anyone have any last words on unfunded priorities? I didn't wanna well, I would say that it's very much worth pursuing reform in this area, um, even though as you pointed out, you know, it'll be baby steps. This doesn't get us all the way there, but it, you need to remove this baked in assumption <laughs> into the process now that you will get everything, that we don't have to have priorities um, that are meaningful, that we don't have to set a strategy that is meaningful and based not only around what we need, but what we can use, what we can afford, um, what our economy and taxpayers can bear. Um, and what we have or don't have already, audit. <laughs> um, the Pentagon, there was a good article about that um, just yesterday in Washington Post, um, you know, that we don't know what we have. So before you go buy something new, you know, look under the couch, check the attic first. But yeah, but this, this very assumption and habit is a very poor budgeting process that, you know, adds to all these um, really bad um, assumptions that we have all and incentives that we have throughout the whole process. And I think it also erodes the, um, you know, the authority structure of the Pentagon and um, the Department of Defense itself. I think the incentive point is a really good one too, because maybe it was Wendy that touched on this briefly before, but, you know, if you, if you basically say, you're going to have this budget here, but we're going to have this other area where you can also spend things on then it kind of incentivizes you to, to put things that are less important into the budget over here, into this big package, so that you can put these things that are gravely important over here, knowing that you're more likely to get them, get them funded, right? So if your goal is to be just maximizing spend and not really economizing or, or working under a budget constraint, we create these really perverse incentives whereby um, the budget that we're actually putting forward isn't reflective of what the real priorities are or should be, even from the perspective of those within the Pentagon, which if you care about national defense, not just fiscal responsibility, that should be really disturbing to you that you're not actually going in and working to get funding for, for the things that are the most, um, the highest priorities. Um, I, you know, I, I would probably be harsher than Nan was earlier when we talked about some of the, the rhetoric issues. I mean, I think to some degree there's, um, 
you know, what I would I would say is maybe an intellectual bankruptcy to to the arguments from the other side in that there really isn't anything being put forth in good faith other than just, you know, it's going to be scary if we don't fund this. Therefore, we absolutely have to fund this. And I think that, you know, fiscal conservatives don't really it, well, it may not be as scary in other parts of government. They would never accept that type of argument when we're talking about, you know, the Department of Education or, you know, Nan mentioning, you know, the Farm Bill, for example. And so it is, there is, I think, this hypocrisy that exists in terms of how we, um, how we talk about the Pentagon budget relative to, to other parts of the budget. Well, um, it's, it strikes me that it's like one <laughs> shell game, as Wendy would say, or sleight of hand or gimmick on top of another, on top of another, on top of another, when it comes to the Pentagon, whether we're talking about OCO or the unfunded priorities, or in the past, the sea-based deterrence fund, the, you know, we're gonna do everything we can to use trickery to spend more. And then on top of that, this um, inflammatory and inaccurate rhetoric that, you know, what's left when you tear these things away? What's left that actually um, does make us more secure that responds to actual threats when you know it's all just smoke and mirrors. And I think it's important to note that the implications of this go far beyond just the budget that we're talking about here and now. You know, so Andrew, you had a piece recently talking about you know the the sort of the long term fiscal implications, where you basically set in motion large amounts of spending in the future. So you're basically just laying the groundwork for you know, spending that may end up being incredibly wasteful in the future by funding it today. I mean, Afghanistan is another great example of this. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people in the sort of public discourse talk about Afghanistan as if, you know, we no longer have troops on the ground, therefore we no longer have costs associated with Afghanistan. Actually, we have huge costs associated with Afghanistan. In fact, arguably, you know, maybe, maybe some of those segments may be bigger than what we were paying during the actual conflict itself. I'm thinking about you know, treatment for mental illness or, or physical uh, casualties and so on. Um, and obviously not everything necessarily falls under the, uh, the, the defense budget per se, but it's a, but there are huge budgetary implications that happen um, as a result of actions that we are taking today. And I think that sometimes we're not properly internalizing the consequences um, beyond just this next year, because we're only looking at Pentagon spending essentially for the next year. And so I wonder if maybe we should talk a little bit about um, what you all see as some of these long-term, you know, uh, uh, drivers of of the defense budget. And you know, are there things that you think that we could be doing, or that we should be maybe emphasizing more to hopefully shift the incentive so that we don't keep having this constant bloat in the future um, being set in motion by things that we're that we're doing today. Well, I can take a stab at, uh, at that to start us off. Um, I would point out something that has not gotten a ton of press, uh, but I have found very interesting, is the um, Secretary of the Air Force, Mr. Kendall, uh, arguing to cut certain programs. The, the Air Force budget wanted to reduce some uh, mostly tactical aircraft, not all tactical aircraft programs. Uh, or they weren't all tactical aircraft programs. Um, and we uh, typically, what will happen is the appropriators will put in their general provisions language. Uh, you can't do that, you can't do that. You know, no, you can't reduce, uh, you can't get rid of this squadron of hurricane hunters in Mississippi, and you can't reduce uh, a certain type of, um, of, of um, refueling aircraft below uh, a base level of X number of aircraft, and that's put in the general provisions. Now, those only general provisions of appropriations bills only last, they only have effect for the length of the, of the fiscal year. Uh, this year, the authorizers put some of those prohibitions into potentially statutory language. Uh, again, sort of like the unfunded priorities list now being a statutory requirement. Uh, Secretary of the Air Force has been pushing back on that and saying, you, you have to give us flexibility in managing our, the sizes of our fleets. And you know, what we argue at TCS is it's pretty rare, a military service says, 
we have enough of this or we don't need to do this anymore. You know, so golly, when the opportunity arises, maybe we should take it. Uh, so uh, the, the idea that you, and I'm not saying a rubber stamp for the president's budget request, of course not, but the blanket, no, you can't reduce anything. No, you can't move this from point A to point B, or more likely Fort A to Fort B. Uh, and that's a fear of base closure, presumably, on the part of some members. Uh, so um, I think that that deserves more attention, the sort of push pull right now, which appears to be centered in the Air Force uh, with the Hill. Uh, future drivers um, beyond Congress just refusing to reduce anything that the Pentagon asked to reduce, uh, certainly shipbuilding. A uh, huge driver of spending, um, shipbuilding programs, uh, you know, will be decades in the in the completion. I mean, not for a single ship, but for a class of ships. Uh, and it, it's an interesting confluence of political support for shipbuilding. You have the typical defense hawk who wants a strong blue water navy. I want a strong blue water navy. You know, uh, I think most people do. Uh, but who say again, oh, you can't, you can't reduce the inventory of that. Uh, you can't retire those cruisers. Uh, so there's the, sh the cost of shipbuilding are, is supported both by the, I would say, um, run of the mill defense hawk. Uh, and you also have the pro-union forces who are very supportive of the shipbuilding programs because shipbuilding is, is a heavily unionized industry and the defense industry in general, as it's getting more high tech, is becoming less unionized, um, it appears to me, to my eye, uh, whereas the heavy metal bending that it is required in shipbuilding uh, is heavily unionized. So it's an interesting political confluence of support for shipbuilding. And I don't see anything that's gonna change that in, uh, in my lifetime anyway. Well, uh, I want to hear uh, Mandy and Ann. I, I do want to hear your your uh, thoughts on on Jonathan's question and on anything Wendy shared. But I just want to add a quick point on shipbuilding because I I wanted to shipbuilding. I think is 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 the sort of upward uh, uh, upward cost driver that 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 uh, I lose a lot of sleep over when it comes to the you know ten year, twenty year, thirty year uh, trajectory of the defense budget. Um, the this topic is relevant and timely because Congressional Budget Office does an annual assessment of the Navy shipbuilding plans, and they just came out with their latest assessment. I can put that link in the chat for folks. Um, they are projecting that the 30-year average cost for the Navy's latest shipbuilding plan is somewhere in the range of 25 to $33 billion per year. Uh, CBO notes that that compares to an average of 23 billion over the last five years. Now that sounds bad, right? Um, you know, we're, or depending on your perspective, it sounds bad. We're, we're increasing costs anywhere from, you know, 2 billion to 10 billion per year compared to the historical average. But, but that also lacks context. The 30 year historical average as of a couple of years ago was 16 billion per year on shipbuilding. So if you're taking the top end of that budget, and we all of us know from from our work that often uh, even uh, CBO projections of of, uh, of of military spending on various uh, weapons and acquisitions programs uh, often get upwardly revised uh, over the years. Uh, but if you're taking the upward range of, of that projection from from CBO that just came out, we're talking about more than doubling uh, the 30 year historical average uh, of Navy shipbuilding spending uh, over the next 30 years. Uh, it, and it's it's a, a lot of it is in service of of the one of the favorite arguments of, of, of defense hawks, which is, you know, that the US is losing ground to China. Well, uh, our friend John Isaacs uh, at the um, uh, Council for a Livable World uh, wrote a, uh, and the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation wrote an excellent piece uh, that I will share in the ch uh, chat that basically it goes through how uh, China is not the new Soviet Union, uh, compares, uh, yes, you know, there are some uh, quantitative metrics where 
where, uh, you know, uh, China might be uh, outstripping the United States, for example, total ships and submarines. But when you compare the number of ballistic missile submarines or nuclear powered aircraft carriers or the tonnage advantage of the U.S. compared to China or the carrier based air power uh, advantage the U.S. has over China, it does not even remotely compare. So it, it's it, it's. It's this crude measuring contest that that uh, quite frankly, like doesn't tell the whole story uh, and and kind of goes back to these simple arguments, um, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, it kind of aligns with the three to five percent argument that, you know, well, well, it's become gospel at this point, you know, three to five percent, three to five percent. Why aren't we questioning that more? It's become gospel in the Navy shipbuilding uh, debate now that well, you know, China's China, China has has an insurmountable advantage versus us. China has an insurmountable advantage. We should question that 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 uh, argument and that logic. Um, and with that, I've been talking too long, Mandy. I cut you off. What did you have to say? <laughs> uh, just two brief things. One, you're kind of touching on it. Nuclear weapon spending is obviously something that we really need to look at too. That, according to press reports, someone in the who was at the Department of Defense who is even starting to raise some questions around the orthodoxy of needing to spend as much money has been pushed out. Um, that it's another area of gamemanship where we have the Department of Defense being able to have review over part of the Department of Energy's budget to put more pressure on increasing spending in that arena and. I have to, at least on uh, Secretary Kendall and him wanting to get rid of legacy systems, I have to say that the Air Force could have an infinite budget and they would still want to get rid of the A-10, but, <laughs> it's, but it is worth looking at. Are there areas that we can take on risk in other arenas? I think what becomes a real challenge for the department though is when they keep on screwing up their modernization programs, the problem is, is that when you retire these legacy systems, you are trying to force all the, the hands of both Congress and the department to continue on these programs and to throw more money, good money after bad because we don't have any alternatives left because they've taken those alternatives away. So I think that's what becomes really challenging when we're talking about getting rid of legacy systems is a lot of these new modern programs aren't better than what we used to have and not in, in a meaningful enough way and they're not affordable and they're not sustainable. And to build on what both Mandy and Wendy said, you know, especially as um, things become more technologically advanced and dependent, um, that comes with an atrocious cost, as we've seen, you know, our favorite example, the F-35, um, where even, you know, the helmets that are made specially for each pilot are just ferociously um, technologically dependent. And not only does that come with a cost in terms of development, in terms of using it, in terms of fixing it, which we often can't do ourselves, we rely on contractors to do that, um, but um, there's all unseen costs in terms of the extra risk that exposes um, our systems to uh, from cyber attackers or, you know, what if you lose power? There's so many little things um, that can go wrong that we experience every day on Zoom calls or when your computer suddenly reboots, when you're doing a slideshow, um, there's so many things that can go wrong and these systems are far from perfect. And yeah, so there's a lot of hard costs and um, hidden costs, but we also need to mention personnel costs. Um, there's just, I mean, the Pentagon has its own entitlement crisis <laughs> that we really don't talk about but it's another area where member after member, when it comes to bills like this, just adds to those unfunded priorities. Well, unfunded mandates, not even priorities that the Pentagon has when it comes to healthcare for soldiers, for their families, for person they met a couple years ago, they've stayed close friends with um, as these programs just expand and expand and you know, maybe some of these costs are justified, but can we really afford them? And how far out of step do we want them to be with civilian healthcare options? And you know, 
means testing and all kinds of, you know, things like that that apply outside the Pentagon. Yeah, retirement costs. I, I remember it, it, a few years ago, a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who I will not name, was testifying before the Senate Armed Services Committee, and he was asked about um, potential non-growth in retirement, not, not cuts, <laughs> but potential non-growth beyond inflation uh, to retirement benefits and, and was given sort of an open-ended question, you know, uh, don't you think that this is something along the lines of, uh, don't you think that kids signing up today need to know, you know, that their benefits will uh, expand, whatever. And uh, this particular chairman of the Joint Chiefs said, you know, when I signed up for the uh, service, I wasn't thinking about my retirement. I, I did not think I was going to be here 40 years later. I didn't think I was going to be sitting in this chair. And it was just hilarious because, of course, that's really true. I mean, you you sign up to serve your country. Uh, you Perhaps you grew up in a family that served their country. Your parents did. Uh, and, you know, to suggest that it's all about the retirement, I think, is um, is uh, tarring service members with a motive that they don't actually have. Well, and then, you know, standing up a whole space force <laughs> and the officers, the bureaucracy uh, that comes with that, the more top heavy we make the ranks, the more these costs explode. And there is an amendment from Representative Jared Huffman that would eliminate the space force, or there's new legislation, I should say. I don't- Introduced was, yesterday. Was the, the, the amendment wasn't yeah. made in order by the rule. But That's Mr. Right. Huffman's, uh, or I'm sorry, it was a Schrader amendment to reduce um, uh, military construction footprint of, of Space Force. The Huffman legislation, which was introduced yesterday or the day before, time is flying, uh, was to end Space Force. Eliminate it. But right. Space um, Guard, that's the new one. <laughs> that's where the real money is. And if we think an F-35 is expensive, how expensive is Space Base One? <laughs> An excellent it's question. Okay. Um, what kind of helmets do you get? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and these are all questions that we would tackle if we had another hour. We do not. Um, I want to be respectful of people's time. Uh, we budgeted for 12.30 to 1.30. And unlike uh, our uh, Defense Hawk friends, we try not to go over budget too often. Uh, but um, uh, I want to I, I want to give us a few minutes of grace time here to go over, uh, and I'd I'd love to hear Mandy and and Wendy your perspectives on a question that we've gotten from an audience member um, uh, that I think is really relevant and important and uh, pertains to sort of the entire underpinning of this eight episode series, which is you know this series uh, and the guests that we've had on and the audience that we've pitched to has often been uh, focused on the folks that we work with every day, folks at other think tanks and advocacy organizations, uh, Capitol Hill staff, members of the administration, members of media. Um, uh, these are all people who engage on these issues every day, who often live in the DMV area uh, and, and, and uh, understand the ins and outs of, of the defense budget and talk in terms of trillions and billions of dollars. Uh, what, what's left unsaid or, or unresolved is, is, are we reaching the general public? And, and in particular, you know, the whole impetus of this series was to sort of talk uh, and, and try to reach uh, uh, folks uh, right of center, fiscal conservatives, people concerned about the federal budget. Uh, I'm not saying it's always easy to message on these issues uh, to progressives, but I think it is a lower hurdle to say to a progressive voter, we should spend less on the military than it is to uh, an independent voter or a centrist voter or a conservative or Republican voter. Um, so in your estimation, if, if you could give, if you could try to answer a huge question in 30 to 60 seconds each, what do our organizations and other folks who care about these issues need to be doing to reach uh, the public, the general public more, and to do a better job at it? 
I will go ahead and start to do some log rolling. <laughs> the project on government oversight realizes that we need to be doing more to reach the general public. And we've created a civic engagement program. If you go to pogo.org, you can sign up to become an uh, advocate for defense accountability. We can give you the talking points you need. I also recommend subscribing to our newsletter, The Bunker, so that we are giving you the cliff notes in a pretty funny way about what is happening with the defense budget. So I think it's something we need to continue to strive to do better. But in, with the um, advocates that we've been working with so far, people get it. Like people understand what's wrong here. And it's just that they need to recognize that their lawmakers actually wanna hear from them too. And just so that they feel like they can be part of their own democracy. Okay, I'll go next. Uh, uh, at Taxpayers for Common Sense, we have a weekly uh, newsletter. You can sign up at uh, www.taxpayer.net uh, and it's called the weekly waste basket and it comes out one of my friends always refers to it as she'll say to me are you writing the trash can this week <laughs> it's not the trash can it's the waste basket but yes uh, and uh, it, you can sign up for it and it gives you it's not just defense um, it's all the topics that we cover at TCS and we often have an idea for um, if you wanna to write to somebody about this issue, who you could write to about it. Um, I will say just in my own personal life, uh, I can remember hearing my mother talking on the phone to somebody and she would, you know, they'd ask what her, you know, how are the kids doing? And she would say, well, my oldest sister, she's a nurse. My middle sister, she's an air force officer. And then they'd say, what does Wendy do? And my mother would be like, um, <laughs> When I was a congressional staffer, she knew what I did. Uh, when I went to the Pentagon, she wasn't entirely sure. Uh, what is it you do on the Pentagon budget? So it's a hard thing to explain to people and we all need to do better at that. Um, there's a lot I could say, but I'd really like to end all this on a down note. So I'm gonna bring it back to rhetoric and say that there's, there's a major challenge. Mandy is right that people understand this when you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, particularly anyone who has served. No one knows waste better than someone who has been in the military. <laughs> um, but we have a real rhetoric problem. I joked earlier that those of us who want to reduce Pentagon waste are often dismissed as hating America, but it's not a joke. That's stuff that has been thrown at us and we want people to be unsafe and we don't care about the service members who have sacrificed so much and nothing could be further from the truth but that's kind of where the discussion is often and if you deign to say something that is less than complimentary about the pentagon and its leadership and the spending choices we make there, it's um, you're rapidly dismissed. And we have two camps of people who every election cycle kind of switch reasons why they need to increase the spending. And on top of that, you have jobs, you have the contractors, um, it's a morass, but this is one place where you can really see the policy implications of our deep societal divisions and unwillingness to face facts. Well, and on, on that very lighthearted note, uh, I do think we are actually out of time, um, but I wanna thank our, our panelists again, uh, Mandy, Wendy, and Nan, thank you all so much. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for uh, co-moderating. And uh, obviously this discussion is an ongoing one that goes well beyond this event. And uh, Look forward to engaging with all of you and everyone who's been watching. So thank you so much for attending. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.